Hello and welcome to today's session. We are continuing to read the play by Edward Albee, The Zoo Story. Uh, we started looking at the outset of the play and the background where uh, in this one act play, Jerry is a lonely man who is encountering, but deliberately going to striking a conversation with another man, Peter, in New York City's Central Park. And he is being, Peter is being compelled to have a conversation with uh, Jerry. And this entire one act play is about how things uh, uh, take an ugly turn towards the end. So the uh, it, it's entirely about uh, these bits of conversation and the kind of insights that we get into these characters' lives, their social lives, their psychological uh, dilemmas, and the larger social setting, which is either facilitating or hindering the kind of conversations that they want to have. So it's uh, um, in, in some fundamental ways, it is about a certain man who is stuck in the social world where he cannot, he's unable to make contacts, personal contacts, he's unable to connect to people and hence he's forced to have these uh, uh, very artificial ways of, uh, uh, you know, sometimes even very forcibly connecting with uh, people whom he randomly uh, meets around him. So we will take a look at the play. I'm sure, you know, most of you have already gone through this uh, text and you do have a sense of how this uh, plot progresses. So uh, Jerry tries to ask uh, very uh, personal questions. Uh, it makes uh, Peter quite uncomfortable because it is quite unlikely in his setting to have such intimate conversations with uh, strangers. Uh, but Jerry seems to be having no inhibitions, you know, no inhibitions whatsoever in uh, asking about either about his family or, you know, whether he's uh, uh, planning or not to have another child or even, you know, about how much he earns a year. So all these things uh, seem quite out of place, though these are very ordinary mundane questions. They seem quite out of place given that, you know, they are just two strangers who have met and there's no background for them to have a conversation like this. And it's not even like the, uh, not even like a random park conversation. Now we find Jerry trying to push the limits of the social boundaries over there. And the social boundaries, which are also uh, heavily dictated by, set by the existing uh, socio-cultural and economic conditions. And what makes it all the most strange is the fact that they both evidently belong to two different social strata. So there is a limit to the kind of conversations that they can have. It is Peter who is very conscious of these boundaries and the discomfort emanates from that. So this discomfort is what the play also capitalizes on, the discomfort which leads to a, a, a tragedy, which is a, a personal tragedy and uh, by extension, the, the tragedy of the social conditions in which the play is set as well. So the conversation that Jerry begins, that he begins to strike this conversation with uh, Peter, and it's about the zoo. He wants to tell a story about visit to zoo. And after having asked certain uh, personal details, which makes uh, uh, Peter uncomfortable, he again comes back to talking about the zoo. Yeah, the zoo, something about the zoo. You mentioned it several times. Zoo, yes, the zoo. I was there before I came here. I told you that. Say, what's the dividing line between upper middle, middle class and lower upper middle class? Yeah. So we find the class question emerging very centrally in the source story as well. If you look at all the other plays that we have discussed so far as part of this course, we find that the question of class, and sometimes it's mixed with gender, sometimes it is uh, you know, evidently mixed with race, we find the class question at the heart of uh, all of these plays. And this, uh, 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 you know, the, the uh, incidence of class becomes a big deal, particularly because of the changing economic situation, a change, the changing economic situation, which obviously privileges certain kinds of classes. And it is uh, also about, you know, uh, sometimes about lineage, sometimes about individual uh, capacities. And we find it operating in multiple ways uh, that, you know, there's no uh, one formula, one template which can accommodate and address these questions. We find class operating, for instance, in a very different way in Emperor Jones, where it is also mixed with race. And uh, in a play like All My Sons, we find the two families, they in some sense belong to the same social class 
and they also used to belong to the same economic uh, uh, class because they were business partners to the two families. But we find that, you know, there is something underneath that in terms of individual value systems, in terms of individual responses to situations that also makes this uh, divide come in and uh, you know, manifest in many different ways. So the class question is deeply embedded in the socioeconomic situation of uh, uh, most of these plays and they're further accentuated either by the family uh, differences or the psychological individual differences or uh, due to the peculiar situations into which each of the characters find themselves in. So here we find that the economic divide, the class divide between these two characters, it's very, very evident over here. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, it, it's very evident, but uh, Peter is also, you know, he does not want to acknowledge that in any way. So there is a kind of a denial, despite knowing that there was a difference. Peter's discomfort initially triggers, is, tr is triggered by the fact that here is a person who looks different, who's, who's almost like an other in that context. They cannot be... Uh, they cannot be sitting together in a bench in Central Park and having an intimate conversation about family and preferences and about pets and children. Yeah, that is not the ideal social climate that Peter is used to. But uh, Jenny is also obviously conscious of that. The only difference here is that Peter is in denial of that. My dear fellow, I have to and my dear fellow me. Look at the difference in language, yeah? Even the body language, it's very evident from the beginning, the way uh, Peter is sitting, uh, you know, with a book and the way he's trying to initially avoid the conversation. And now the kind of language they use is vocabulary and the body language here. It is also, uh, you know, indicative of those are all markers of this uh, divide. Was I patronizing? I believe I was. I am sorry. But you see your question about classes bewildered me yeah so this is the denial which this play is also trying to address yeah even while inhabiting and accessing the privileges which are part of this which are which are you know become available because of this class divide to certain um, sections of the society peter can also afford to ask this politically correct question also you know he can afford to be rightly bewildered by the mention of class this uh, we find that, you know, uh, operates in the same way as, uh, you know, race or gender or caste, this bewilderment, yeah. So uh, this bewilderment, which also absolves one from getting implicated into this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, you know, non-egalitarian system. And when you're bewildered, you become patronizing. I, I don't express myself too well. Sometimes he attempts to joke on himself. I am in publishing, not writing. Yeah. So here is this discomfort with the borderline between this discomfort and uh, his attempt to become kinder towards Jerry. It's, it's a very, very thin, uh, uh, you know, a very, very thin line. Um, so Jerry, I'm used, but not to the humor. So be it. The truth is I was being patronizing. Oh, now you needn't say that. It's at this point that Jerry may begin to move about the stage with slowly increasing determination and authority, but pacing himself so that the long speech about the dog comes at the high point of the arc. Yeah. So here is, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of a role reversal too. We find that uh, Jerry can also become very manipulative. Yeah? The psychological depth that he has in terms of knowing himself and knowing others, it is quite uncanny here. He begins to capitalize on this situation and he begins to patronize Peter yeah, and, uh, and 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 uh, in, in, in such very subtle ways. So we also get an insight, uh, kind of a preview into the conversation that uh, lies ahead. So Jerry, all right. Who are your favorite writers, Baudelaire and J.P. Markant? Well, I like great many writers have a considerable Catholicity of taste. Yeah, pay attention to the vocabulary over here, the, the conservative nature of taste preferences and the class divide in terms of this taste as well which is getting foregrounded over here if i may say so those two men are fine each in his way Baudelaire, of course uh, is by far the finer of the two but uh, mark has a place in our you know, national skip it huh? so uh we get to realize that jerry is in fact trying to uh, analyze him as a character, analyze Peter as a character by asking about the preferences, identifying the class markers through that, identifying the biases and prejudices through that. 
and we do this too as students of literature we do know how in terms of literary historiography a writer like Baudelaire and a writer like Market how they both are placed yeah so uh, do you know what I did before I went to the zoo today I walked all the way up Fifth Avenue from Washington Square so if you look at the kind of details that they both exchange you know exchange in terms of you know what Jerry offers and also what Jerry manages to cull out from Peter there's a mundane ordinariness there's an immediacy about the kind of things that Jerry is sharing because there's nothing larger about his life it's all about the immediate things where he went before that and what he plans to do right after the streets and the crossings that he uh, crossed on the way so uh, and uh, but about Peter yeah he's trying to situate this incident perhaps in the larger scheme of things which is not the case clearly not the case with Jerry for whom this itself is the major highlight of his day oh you live in the village this seems to enlighten Peter no I don't I took this uh, subway down to the village so I could walk all the way up Fifth Avenue to the zoo it's one of those things a person has to sometimes a person has to go a very long distance out of his way to come back a short distance correctly yeah there's something very Sisyphean about this exercise that Jerry is doing yeah? it is not about the subways yeah if you think about the way one ordinarily would look at a subway it is to make the commute easier it's to lessen the distance you know that uh, to lessen the time taken to cover a distance yeah so it's all about convenience it's all about saving time but here we find a person who in a very Sisyphean way he takes the subway he takes the subway down to village so he could walk up the fifth avenue to the zoo he's taking a roundabout way in order to uh, come back a short distance correctly it's, it's a uh, it is a something that entirely beats the rationality of the economy within which the place within which the setting of the play is uh, placed yeah oh I thought you lived in the village what were you trying to do make sense of things bring order the old pigeonhole bit well that's easy I, I'll tell you so here we also find that while Jerry's questions are very pointed while there is of course a subtle analytical uh, framework which is at work in the background because we as readers we are also trying to analyze and interpret this uh, Jerry is trying to uh, there's something very 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 meta textual over here Jerry is trying to simultaneously critique what Peter is doing and what as a reader we are trying to do as well yeah this there are a set of things there are a set of random things which are being brought together because of the way Jerry is initiating this conversation and as readers and as a part and as a participant in that conversation J uh, Peter what uh, the, the, the reader as well as Peter are trying to do is to bring order to make sense out of things this is also you know cutting across uh, this is also trying to um, majorly challenge the way in which one tries to read text yeah about trying to make sense about trying to bring order these things cannot be random it has to be a way in which one will connect to the other that is the thing that uh, Jerry is critiquing over here the old pigeon hole bit well that's easy I'll tell you I live in a four-story brownstone rooming house on the Upper West Side between Columbus Avenue and Central Park West I live on the top floor rare West yeah he's giving all these details just so one shouldn't one wouldn't you know spend a lot of time trying to analyze trying to read through these texts the Sisyphean exercise of him taking the subway and going all the way you know till the you know, village so that he can walk a shorter distance yeah that is something which will not make sense to a modern mind yeah because it entirely beats the economies of uh, uh, almost everything which is part of modernity so here we find Jerry offering an easy way out saying see if you there is a question if there is something that you need to know about me you can just ask me directly just the way I ask you directly there is no need to pose or no need to ask a range of euphemistical questions within which one could locate a person within which one could compartmentalize and slot a person so I live on the top floor rare west it's a laughably small room and one of my walls is made of beaver boat this beaver boat separates my room from another laughably small room so assume that the two rooms were once one room a small room but not necessarily laughable uh, the, the, and, and look at the placing of the word laughable yeah you can also you know uh, 
run this in your mind and you know figure out who is laughing at who here you know the sarcasm comes out of the intense humiliation and the intense uh, uh, biases and prejudices to which uh, a character like Jerry perhaps has always been subjected to. The room beyond my beaver boat wall is occupied by a colored queen who always keeps his door open. Well, not always, but always when he's plucking his eyebrows, which he does with Buddhist concentration. This colored queen has a rotten teeth, which is rare, and he has a Japanese kimono, which is also pretty rare. And he wears this kimono to and from the john in the hall, which is pretty frequent. I mean, he goes to the john a lot here. Yeah. And again, pay attention to the vocabulary, the kind of registers which are uh, being used over here. He never bothers me and he never brings anyone up to his room. All he does is pluck his eyebrows, wear his kimono and go to the john. So this is his life. These are the kind of people who are there in his quote-unquote neighborhood. Now the two front rooms on my floor are a little larger, I guess, but they're pretty small too. There's a poor Torican family in one of them, a husband, a wife and some kids. I don't know how many. These people entertain a lot and in the other front room, there's somebody living there. I don't know who it is. I've never seen who it is. Never, never, ever. Yeah. So microcosm of uh, another kind of life, which is on the other side of the city, which is on the other side of uh, the lives that people like Peter inhabit. And this microcosm is also, you know, it also symbolizes in so many ways the melting pot that America is, the cultural uh, diversity that it promotes and the flip side of it, yeah, and the flip side of it, which, you know, which also accentuates the class divide. There is a superficial diversity, but underneath that, there is a there is evidently a diversity, but underneath that, there are also a lot of non-egalitarian ways in which uh, the system operates. Peter's embarrassed with these details. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing, uh, you know, uh, exotic or fancy about this. And he obviously is an intelligent man who can also sense the, the, the darkness underneath it. Why do you live there? I don't know. It doesn't sound a very nice place where you live. Well, no, it isn't an apartment in the East 70s, but then again, I don't have one wife, two daughters, two cats and two pair of kids. What I do have, I have toilet articles, a few cloths, a hot plate that I'm not supposed to have. Yeah? So look at these details. Yeah? All his, it, it almost looks as if he's been waiting for this one moment to pour out all the mundane details of his life. Yeah? Everything that has happened in his life, everything that he has in his life, which essentially can be packed into this conversation that one is having in Central Park. Yeah? While for uh, somebody like Peter, this is only one lazy Sunday afternoon, which is not even you know, part of his uh, uh, mainstream life, part of his core life. Yeah? This seems to be life itself for Jerry. This seems to be that one opportunity where he can make a carnival out of his life. Yeah. So a knife, two forks, two spoons, one small and large, three plates, a cup, a saucer, a drinking glass, two picture frames, both empty, eight or nine books, a pack of pornographic playing cards, regular deck, an old Western Union typewriter that prints nothing but capital letters. So the details also tell uh, tells us about the flawed nature of the items that he possesses. He possesses an assortment of things. Yeah, uh, everything not necessarily useful, but they are also flawed in some form or the other. And a small strong box without a lock, which has in it what rocks, some rocks, sea rounded rocks I picked up on the beach when I was a kid under which way down are some letters. Please letters, please why don't you do this? And please, when will you do that letters? And when letters too? When will you write? When will you come? When? These letters are from more recent years. It also gives a sense of longing over here. Yeah, This isn't a very pretty picture. There are a set of objects. There are a set of things which are very mundane, which uh, are you know some form. You know, he's talking about a hot plate that he's not supposed to have. Among these possessions, he uh, owns things which he's not supposed to own. He has things which are completely uh, flawed. He also has things which are uh, useless. Yeah, rocks. Yeah, there is a, uh, a you know the box in which he's storing these useless objects, these useless rocks. Yeah, and which under which are some letters. Yeah, and letters which uh, has these questions. Perhaps when will you write? When will you come? These letters are from more recent years, so maybe you know there are, there is a certain uh, 
background to this, a certain past to this that we are not aware of. Yeah? And he's also very clearly separating this from what Peter has, a wife, two daughters, two cats, two parakeets. Yeah? And in those, in, 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 those um, in that description, which does not have any object. There's a full life over there. Yeah? Because it, an apartment in the East 70s, as he puts it, yeah, that has that picture-perfect life. It's an ideal life compared to these, these random many objects and uh, the useless and the flawed things which uh, Jerry's apartment has. Yeah? So this contrast is very, very evident over here, which is why perhaps, you know, when uh, Jerry was asking these questions to Peter. Now, if you go back to the first segment of this play and read it, the questions are pretty much straightforward, to which he has very straightforward answers about which he can be entirely proud of, you know, very reputable answers, very answers which could, you know, accentuate his position in the society. But still, that makes him uncomfortable, yeah? And you do find the abstract nature of class divide over here. Here, Jerry is the one who should be embarrassed about the kind of uh, life that he is leading. These are the details which should make one uncomfortable. But on the other hand, the discomfort uh, that Peter faces is largely because, you know, there's an intrusion into his world. There's an intrusion into his privacy. So the play in that sense, as it, uh, you know, grows, it's also asking questions about privacy, questions about privacy and how there is an inherent privilege built into it. There's an inherent class angle and an economic state is built into it. Yeah? So Peter stares glumly at his shoes then. He doesn't know how to respond. This is clearly the most different conversation, the exotic conversation that he's had in his entire life, perhaps, about those two empty picture frames. Now, he's also getting curious about Jerry's life. I don't see why they need an explanation at all. Isn't it clear? I don't have pictures of anyone to put in them. Your parents, perhaps a girlfriend, you're a very sweet man, and you're possessed of a truly enviable innocence. These are the expectations, which have very, uh, again, you know, which have markers of privilege as well. There is an expectation that when there is an app, there's a picture frame, there's an empty picture frame, it's not supposed to be empty. That's not how it works. There should be a picture of somebody. This also operates with this assumption that one takes for granted in most societies that everyone will have somebody whom they can you know, put within a picture frame, you know, someone whom they can you know, allot a space for. And that is not the case here, we find, you know, it's not as ordinary, as naive it, as it looks like. And uh, Jerry also, you know, now we find Jerry is the one who is uh, uh, getting a bit condescending over here due to the circumstances, which clearly, this, because of the same reason, does not offend uh, Peter either. You're possessed of a truly enviable innocence. And this is a kind of innocence that somebody with Jerry's background cannot even afford to. Yeah? But good old mom and good old pop are dead, you know. I'm broken up about it too, I mean really. But that particular vaudeville act is playing the cloud circuit now, so I don't see how I can look at them all neat and framed. Besides, or rather, to be pointed about it, good old mom walked out on good old pop when I was 10 and a half years old. She embarked on an adulterous turn of our southern states, a journey of a year's duration. And her most constant companion, among others, among many others, was a Mr. Barleycorn, at least. That's what good old pop told me after he went down, came back, brought her body north. We'd received the news about Christmas and New Year's, you see, that good old mom had parted with a ghost in some dump in Alabama. And without the ghost, she was less welcome. I mean, what was she? A stiff northern stiff. At any rate, good old Pop celebrated the New Year for an even two weeks and then slapped into the front of a somewhat moving city omnibus, which sort of cleaned things out family-wise. Very dark picture of a family. Something which is entirely outside the league of a person like Peter. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very different world out there altogether. And this is this family drama with tragedy, adultery, uh, you know, the, the pathos of having uh, an almost orphan child. Everything is built into this. Yeah, it's not, you know, now we also begin to see how despite the complexity of the career, perhaps Peter has, his family seems quite simple, you know, very straightforward, very neat. One wife, two daughters, two parakeets, yeah. There is that neatness is absolutely not there in the small life, in the relatively small life that Jerry 
inhabits. Yeah. Well, no, there was mom's sister who was given neither to sin nor the consolations of the bottle. I moved in on her and my memory of her is slight, except excepting I remember still that she did all things dourly. Sleeping, eating, walking, praying, she dropped dead on the stairs to her apartment, my apartment then too, on the afternoon of my high school graduation. A terribly middle European joke, if you ask me. Yeah. So this is Jerry's life in a nutshell. It's tragedy one after the other, which also has a lot of uh, uh, uncomfortable family details. Uh, there is adultery. There's a father who kills himself. There is an aunt, yeah, who can't take the pressure and, you know, eventually she too dies, yeah. And it's a terribly middle European joke, if you ask me. Peter's beginning to feel sorry. Oh my, oh my, oh your what? But that was a long time ago and I have no feeling about any of it that I care to admit it to myself. Perhaps you can see, though, why good old mom and good old pop are framed less. How, what's your name, your first name, yeah. So, uh... Jenny is very quick to move on from this. He evidently has moved on from all these things and these tragedies, which can perhaps, you know, scar people for a lifetime. They seem to be these um, uh, little details that Jerry can bring out during a random uh, park conversation. Yeah, but towards the end of the play, we also realize that this is all, you know, has been bottled up inside him. We don't even know whether he ever had a chance to speak about all this to another human being in his during his adult life maybe which is why this is like one chance that he had been looking for to uh to pour out everything to 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 share all of this in whichever form with another human being be before he brings an end to all of this so they exchange their names uh, and then let's see now what's the point of having girls picture and so he's giving a very rational very dark though, uh, an explanation of why the empty frames are there. So I have, uh, what's the point of having girls picture, especially in two frames? I have two picture frames, you remember. I never see the pretty little ladies more than once and most of them wouldn't be caught in the same room with the camera. It's odd and I wonder if it's sad. The girls? No, I wonder if it's sad that I never see the little ladies more than once. I've never been able to have sex with or how is it put? Make love to anybody more than once. Once, that's it. Oh, wait, for a week and a half when I was 15. And I hang my head in shame that puberty was late. I was, he's just spelling the word out, H-O-M-O-S-E-X-U-A-L, yeah? I mean, I was cured. There's an unspeakability about the queer sex preference, yeah, that have an unspeakability about the word homosexual, uh, uh, the word homosexuality. He doesn't want to admit. Uh, he he does uh, mention that you know he is a homosexual, but evidently with a lot of uh, uh, shame. So you find you know this uh, Cherry's life is a huge mess in so many different ways. It is messed up, not due to his fault. It's because of, you know, the various things around him not working out well because of the circumstances, because of the traditional frameworks within which he does not fit in, not in terms of a family. There is a heteronormative uh, norm which had gone entirely wrong in his uh, parents' uh, uh, you know life. Yeah, It is tainted by adultery. And in his own life, his sexual preferences are you know, do come in the way of him inhabiting a normal uh, life, yeah, no, quote unquote, a normal life, yeah. So, uh, but, and, and then he also says, oh, I do love the little ladies, really love them for about an hour. Well, it seems perfectly simple to me. Look, are you going to tell me to get married and have parakeets? Forget the parakeets. Stay single if you want to. It's no business of mine. I didn't start this conversation, yeah. So, uh, this is... Uh, even when Peter wants to make it easier for Jerry with his words, with his uh, sympathetic words, with his comforting words, it doesn't work that way. It only offends Jerry in some form or the other. I'm sure that, you know, I mean, this is uh, quite self-explanatory and uh, you can also, you know, uh, begin to see how it works as a social critique as well as a psychological critique and there is an added element of these uh, the, the cure element which makes it more complex you know more uh, uh, you know problematic given the uh, economies within which a person like Peter is operating so um, 
with this we will bring today's uh, session to a close and we would perhaps uh, we would uh, uh, try and discuss some of the major themes in the forthcoming sessions and uh, we would find that you know uh, in this play it's not about the action per se but in these words which are exchanged these stories which are being told it doesn't even matter whether these stories are entirely true or not but you know, clearly what is uh, being foregrounded over here is the world of differences between two classes which cannot be captured in a linear neat form it's a complexity of this it's the I know unnarratability of this which is getting foregrounded over here and this is just a one-off instance this encounter between the two classes is just a one-off instance also signifying a divide which cannot be easily bridged yeah? so with this we bring this class to a, a close and I will look forward to seeing you again in the next session thank you for your time